Please direct your attention to the video screens. His day is done, is done. The news came on the wings of a wind, reluctant to carry its burden. Nelson Mandela's day is done. The news expected and still unwelcome reached us in the United States, and suddenly our world became somber. Our skies were leaden. His day is done. We see you, South African people, standing speechless at the slamming of that final door through which no traveler returns. Our spirits reach out to you, Bantu, Zulu, Rosa, Boer. We think of you and your son of Africa, your father, your one more wonder of the world. We send our souls to you as you reflect upon your David, armed with a mere stone, facing down the mighty Goliath, your man of strength, Gideon, emerging triumphant, although born into the brutal embrace of apartheid, scarred by the savage atmosphere of racism, unjustly imprisoned in the bloody maws of South African dungeons. Would the man survive? Could the man survive? His answer strengthened men and women around the world. In the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, in Chicago's Loop, in New Orleans' Mardi Gras, in New York City's Times Square. We watched as the hope of Africa sprang through the prison's doors, his stupendous heart intact, his gargantuan will ale and hearty. He had not been crippled by brutes, nor was his passion for the rights of human beings diminished by 27 years of imprisonment. Even here in America, we felt the cool, refreshing breeze of freedom. When Nelson Mandela took the seat of presidency in his country, where formerly he was not even allowed to vote, we were enlarged by tears of pride as we saw Nelson Mandela's former prison guards invited courteously by him to watch from the front rows his inauguration. We saw him accept the world's award in Norway with the grace and gratitude of the Solon in ancient Roman courts and the confidence of African chiefs from ancient royal stools. No sun outlasts its sunset but will rise again and bring the dawn. Yes, Mandela's day is done. Yet we, his inheritors, will open the gates wider for reconciliation, and we will respond generously to the cries of blacks and whites, Asian, Hispanics, the poor who live piteously on the floor of our planet. He has offered us understanding. We will not withhold forgiveness, even from those who do not ask. Nelson Mandela's day is done. We confess it in tearful voices, yet we lift our own to say thank you. Thank you, our Gideon. Thank you, our David, our great courageous man. We will not forget you. We will not dishonor you. We will remember and be glad that you lived among us, that you taught us, and that you loved us all.
free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. During the course of our interviews, I would ask him, I'd say, Madiba, tell me what was different about the man who emerged from prison than the man who went in, and how did that happen? His first public appearance in nearly three decades, 72 years old, he said, I came out mature. Walking strongly, step by step. I met Nelson Mandela in December of 1992 when I went down to South Africa to work with him on what became his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. When I first met him, I realized this was just an absolutely historic opportunity, and I begged him, could I just be with him every day, no matter what he did, and we would find time to talk. I spent about a year and a half with him almost every day. It was an amazing experience to, to, to try to plumb what happened to him in his life in a way that would then make sense to a reader. And I think for him, it was, it was both therapeutic and actually enjoyable. In prison, there have been men, you know, who are very good. For years and years after having worked with him, people would always say to me, I, I can't believe he came out of prison and wasn't bitter or angry. And uh, they do everything to try and make you as happy as possible. And that has wiped out any bitterness which a man could have. I'd always smile at that because I did discover that he, he was tremendously hurt and wounded and bitter about what happened to him. But he also realized to create this multiracial, free, democratic South Africa, it had to be a rainbow nation. It had to be black and white and brown. We had to walk along and half path to arrive here. No one could feel like they had some special right of citizenship or they were excluded from that. And he taught himself to not show any of that bitterness or anger. He made incredible efforts, and I think they were strategic to have, when he came out of prison, have meetings with his old guards. And he would go back and see the old apartheid leaders of South Africa. All of that to show that as he would say so many times, the past is the past, or forget about the past. And, and what I knew from working with him and talking to him is that he couldn't forget about the past. He, he dwelt on the past. And one wonders what must be passing through Mr. Mandela's mind at this moment. He did feel that he had lost the best and richest part of his life, and, and he had. He, was a person who I always thought that in a different society, in a free and democratic society, he might have been a, a small town lawyer and, and, and had a big family and, and never have been that ambitious. The trigger for it was when he went to Johannesburg as a young man when he was 17 or 18, having grown up and lived in, an air, in a pretty much all black area of South Africa, the, the trans guy and part of the, the Koza tribe, he had never really experienced prejudice or apartheid directly, and when he did, it, it changed his life and changed the destiny of South Africa. So I would like to be remembered, uh, not uh, as anybody unique or special, but as part of a great team in this country that has struggled uh, for many years, for decades, and even centuries to bring about at this day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Stingel, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, U.S. Department of State. How are you? Nice to see you again. How is everybody? I don't know if I feel enough energy in the room. Because you can't just wait for this guy to come out. So I'm, I'm so, so, so happy to be with you here today. Um, you're probably wondering who this old guy is on stage compared to that young guy that was, was on, on the film there.
But when I see, uh, when I see him, it always it makes me both so happy and so sad at the same time, um, because I miss him. He, I remember once he said to me, we used to take these long walks when we were out in the trans sky, and he said, you know, Richard, many people love me from afar. Not many people love me from up close. I loved him from up close, which was the greatest privilege of my entire life. And I just want to tell you a little bit about him. Um, and I, there's a favorite story that I want to tell you. So I worked with him, as you saw in the video, on, on Long Walk to Freedom. And at the time we were working on the book, he was writing the Constitution of South Africa, and he was running for president of South Africa. And he wanted to go down and campaign. How many people are here from South Africa? <laughs> Fantastic. Amandla. <laughs> so, anyone from Natal? So, I see. So he wanted to go down and campaign in KwaZulu-Natal, where he wasn't so popular. And everybody advised him not to go, and he really wanted to do it. And we, we were going to fly down there, and he had a tiny little plane with just two seats in it. So he got on the plane with his bodyguard, a guy named Mike. Tiny little propeller plane, and I went down to the airport in Natal, waiting for him, because then we were going to go to the rally. So about halfway down through the flight, um, I got a phone call from the people at the airport saying um, that, well, actually, I'm going, to tell the, I'm going to tell you from Mike's perspective. So Mike was on the plane, and he told me about this afterwards. About halfway down, Mandela was just sitting there reading the newspaper, and he loved reading newspapers because he wasn't allowed to read newspapers during 27 years in prison. And they're sitting across from each other, and then Mike felt a little tap on his knee. And he said, Mike, you might want to tell the pilot that the propellers are not working. <laughs> so Mike, by the way, this was maybe his first flight ever. And he just walked over to the cockpit. And he said, hey, Mandela says the, the propellers are not working. And the, and the pilot said, yes, we know. One of them is working. One of them is not. You usually can land the plane safely, but we've called ahead. There's ambulances there. They're putting foam on the runway. <laughs> Everything should be OK. So Mike went back. He explained this to Mandela. And you saw how Mandela, you know, he had that face. Sometimes he was smiling. Sometimes he was frowning. And he just listened very calmly. He said, very good, very good, and went back to reading his newspaper. <laughs> so Mike later told me that, you know, he, he could barely sit still. You know, he was petrified, and he said the only thing that kept him calm during the flight, the only thing that kept him calm during the flight was that he would look at, at Nelson Mandela reading the paper so calmly, and that just made him calm. So, lo and behold, the flight lands. Everything was fine. They didn't need to use the foam or the ambulances. Mandela got off the plane. There happened to be a busload of Japanese tourists there. And again, if you know Nelson Mandela, he has to say hello to everybody and shake every hand. And he bounded off the plane, smiling, you know, laughing, shaking hands with all of these Japanese tourists. It took like 20 minutes. We were late for the rally. And then I was waiting in this, this black armed iron BMW that we were, we were in. And he finally shook the last hand. He came in. He sat down next to me. And he turned to me and he said, man, I was terrified up there. <laughs> so what that reminded me of is during all these interviews we used to do, he would tell me, and in the beginning it always amazed me, he said, I was frightened. When I first went to Robben Island and the guards threatened me, I was frightened. You know, when, uh, when I had to meet with the government, I was frightened. And I remember thinking, this is Nelson Mandela telling me that he's frightened? How could Nelson Mandela be scared? And I asked him that one day. And he said, Richard, it would be irrational not to be afraid. He was a very rational man. And that taught me one of the great lessons of leadership that he teaches everybody is that 
There is no courage without fear. Without fear, there is no courage. That what he had to do time and time again during his entire life was to sublimate that fear because he knew he had something more important and he couldn't let people see it. He had to turn it into something else, turn it into his vision for what he wanted to do. And all of his life, he kept one great goal in front of him. That goal was freedom for his people, one person, one vote. And he, he used to make a distinction between strategy and tactics. You heard of that distinction before? Strategy was the principle, tactics was how, how you got there. And he kept that one principle of freedom, of democracy, but how he got there, he was willing to compromise. And that is a lesson for all of you, is to keep your principles in front of you, but be practical how you get them. So he would be so happy to see you. He's smiling from somewhere today. He was a devout believer, a, a devout student of leadership, but a, a devout student of African leadership. So you know he, I, I mentioned there that he was from this little town in the Transkai, Mkwikazeni. And one of the things that people, that you read about him all the time, which I know is not true, is people say, well, he was from a royal family. He was an African aristocrat. He was a natural aristocrat but he wasn't an aristocrat by birth. His father was a headman, appointed by the British. And he was also the counsel for the king of the Tembu tribe, Jongataba. And when Nelson Mandela's father died, when he was 12 years old, his mother sent him to live with the king because he was the son of the council. And he became best friends with the king's son, a young man named Justice. But what that did for him was it educated him in African leadership and the history of African leadership. He heard stories about the great leaders from the 15th and 16th and 17th century. And he observed the king whom he greatly admired. And I used to sit in on meetings with him. This is before he was president, when he was talking with his, his group of, of leaders. And you know, he's an incredibly powerful, charismatic person. But, and I would sit in the meeting and not say anything, but he would, he would let every person talk before he said anything. He was always the last to speak. And when he spoke at the end, it was about summarizing what he had heard before and trying to find some consensus from what everybody said. That to him was African leadership. That was what was different in part about African leadership than Western leadership. Because he used to observe the king doing this. The king would listen to all of his counselors without speaking and then summarize what was said. Mandela did that himself because consensus was so important. Remember when he came out of prison, he talked about the ANC as being a collective, that I am a, a loyal servant of the ANC and a loyal servant of the people. He really was. He saw himself as a representative of this organization and of those people. And I think I'm so pleased that you've all been here. I hope there are things about America an American leadership that you've learned, but I think also Americans need to learn from African leaders too. They need to learn from a sense of consensus as well, which is something that we don't always see in our politics. So he would be... <laughs> so, so he would be delighted to see you, and he really believed, and I think you are the emblems of this. You're a thousand points of light. There is an, a, there's a renaissance of African leadership going on now, and you are the representative of that. He would be so proud of you, but you have a responsibility too. You have to lead. As he would say, quoting somebody else, and this is relevant not only for Africa, but for America, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and good women to do nothing. That's relevant to all of us and relevant in America as well. So um, I want to thank you, and I just want to say on that leadership note, so when, he, when I left working with him, it wasn't the last time I saw him, but, um, but I felt like the sun had gone out of my life. He was an incredibly sunny character. But I have to say, 
that seeing all of you here, I feel like the sun has come back into my life and in the life of Africa. And so go back and lead. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, direct your attention to the video screens. of the name Mandela to the name Washington in the fellowship program is really important because it shows the partnership between the United States and the continent of Africa. When the decision was made to name the program in Nelson Mandela's honor, it really spoke to so many of them because they see how many aspects of his leadership, how he was a servant leader, how he thought first about the people, how it was about we and not I. And and I think that that message resonates with so many of the leaders, and they see how important it is, I think, for the changes that they want to make. And the spirit of this program reflects Madiba's optimism, his idealism, his belief in what he called the endless heroism of youth. Uh, we are proud to announce uh, that the new name of this program is the Mandela Washington Fellowship. <laughs> it was fantastic to hear that it was renamed the Mandela Washington Fellowship. I remember that moment, I think an electrifying moment because everyone just rose up and you know, was clapping hands and everyone was really excited because I think it took, it took us all back to Africa. Sometimes in today's world, we put so much emphasis on charisma, you know, how, how brilliant a speaker someone is, but we forget uh, things like integrity, humility, a forgiveness, which I think was a cardinal thing in Mandela's uh, life, you know, he spent all those years in prison. It would have been so justifiable if he came out and exerted revenge on all those people that did all those things to him. But he was able to show strength of character by forgiving, because he knew that was the only way to unite the country. The incredible assets, the amazing accomplishments, the inspiring endurance, but also the flaws and the humanity and the challenges uh, and the conflicts that he faced, um, which helps to unpeel what leadership is really about. The concept of seventh leadership has really impacted me in my work very much because I believe that leaders are people who want to serve. Mandela's vision helps us to say with differences, we can move ahead through peaceful coexistence. With differences among us, we can still come together and work as one, regardless of many views. He always had tolerance. He always had patience. He always believed in the goodness of everybody. And he always wanted to give back. They are collaborating. They're working together to solve problems. They're sharing ideas with one another. They're thinking about how to bring their own countries and communities into the future. They're thinking about what's wrong and what they need to right. But they're thinking about how to do that through policy, connection, civil society, business, and entrepreneurship, all ways of, of innovating the way Africa's operating now. We are privileged to be entrusted with the responsibility or obligation to save others. And uh, we must always make sure that we safeguard that trust and that confidence that has been bestowed into us. The older generations believe that they have much to teach younger people, and they do. But they don't believe they have anything to learn from them. We need to trust the capacity of young people to find sustainable solutions to the problems that we're confronting. It's about learning, it's about adapting, it's about forgiving, uh, it's about accommodating and compromising 
and moving things forward to accomplish a greater goal. And Mandela is a great example of where we should be and how we should live our lives. Remembering, but building on the leadership. Very clearly, Bird said that Nelson Mandela said, it's in your hands now. It is time for new heads to lift the burdens. It is in your hands now. Mandela only served one term as president of South Africa. He forfeited the power and the prestige of serving as president for the betterment of the country to show that passing the torch was an important principle of democracy, just like George Washington did here in the United States. Our Mandela fellows, you can see, hold the same principles true to their own hearts, and they put service first. Every day we see the changes that they're making all across the continent and the relationships they're making around the world. This was a fantastic platform that just springboarded us to another level, and I'm really grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Linda Thomas-Greenfield, Assistant Secretary, Bureau of African Affairs, U.S. Department of State. Good afternoon. How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. It's really an honor for me to be here today to speak to all of you as you round out what I know has been an extraordinary rich experience in your respective universities across the United States. And I know uh, you've had an exciting week so far, and I suspect that your excitement will peak later this afternoon, not by my speaking, but who comes after me. It's really amazing to see a thousand of you here today double the number that we had last year. And I'm thrilled by the growth in this program, and I want to start out by congratulating all of you for being selected to what you know was an extraordinarily competitive program. I've had the privilege of meeting some of you in advance of today. I met the Liberian cohort in May, where are you, Liberians? Uh, when I was visiting Liberia, they had just been selected. Uh, I also met this year's cohort at Howard University. Are you here in the room? <laughs> and I apologize to those of you who were at Madison, Wisconsin. I was supposed to meet all of you, and I welcome every single one of you here today. On Monday night, I had the opportunity to meet the 50 entrepreneurs who received grants from the Africa Development Foundation, and I want to congratulate all of you for your success. Good. You know, when people ask me what is the most important initiative that the U.S. government under the Obama administration has in Africa, what will be the Obama legacy in Africa? And everybody has a different answer to that question. I got one, Yali. <laughs> I, I point to Yali for many reasons, but the most important one is all of you. All of you, what all of you bring to this program. Your talent, your passion, and your potential. You've heard this before, but I'm going to say it to you again. You are Africa's future. And you inspire all of us. You inspire all of us every day by your enthusiasm, by your ambition, and by your creativity. You are the reason, in the face of so many challenges, that we all continue to strive to make Africa better. Empowering young people is at the heart of U.S.-Africa relations. Our mission is to partner with Africa to promote democracy, peace, prosperity, and opportunity. And we believe those goals are intertwined in everything we do. As we work toward these goals, I can think of no better partner than all of you. The Mandela Washington Fellows. You've already made a big difference through the work you've done in your home countries. 
And that's why you were all chosen for this program. And it is our hope that the program helps you to make even a bigger impact in your country. When President Obama addressed the African Union in Ethiopia last year, he said, and I'd like to quote, the most urgent task facing Africa today and for decades ahead is to create opportunity for the next generation. 70% 70 of Africans are, Africans are under the age of 25. 70%. It's a youthful continent. We have to ensure that youth like yourselves are engaged in your communities and you're vested in the futures of your country. That's a central goal of YALI. You are the change agents. You're the change agents of the future, and you'll need to take the skills and the ambitions that you have to encourage other young people, because you're kind of just a drop in the bucket. So we need you to be change agents, to be that one drop of red paint in the bucket of white that will taint the whole bucket to infect all African youth with the enthusiasm and the dreams that you have. Your ambitions will have to encourage other young people who do not have the advantages that you have. They need you to invest in them the way we have invested in you. We also have to ensure that women are fully engaged in their communities and contributing to their country's growth in all areas. <laughs> I'm really thrilled to say that half of the Mandela Washington Fellows in this room are women. <laughs> Nothing against you guys now. <laughs> it was one of your colleagues, I was here at the opening, and I can't remember uh, which, whether it was Natasha or your other colleague, who said that women must lean in they must lean in completely. This is your time, she said. Let's own it. We know African countries cannot succeed if they leave half of their populations out of the mix. So I encourage women out there, let your voices be heard. <laughs> and I encourage you men to listen. I encourage you to listen. Listen to the voices of these women because they are your partners. <laughs> As you all think about your future back home after you return, and I know that all of you are anxious to get back home to your families and to your traditional foods and to your own culture. <laughs> I do want you to consider a famous quote. And you've all heard it before. President John F. Kennedy, he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. <laughs> Let me hear you all say it. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Do you know that this quote was made 55 years ago? And it still inspires all of us today. It still resonates with us, and it continues to be relevant, regardless of who we are and what country we're from. So for those of you who are not staying on for the internship program uh, this summer, let me just state, this is the beginning. For those of you who are returning home, this is the beginning. It's the beginning of a long-term commitment to being a force for good. And it is the beginning of the next chapter of your lives, back in your home countries, where you will be not asking what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The responsibility of being a Washington, a Mandela Washington Fellow carries with it a huge burden to succeed. I know about that burden coming from a segregated background where you can't fail. I'm putting the burden on you. 
You cannot fail. Your burden is to succeed. It also means that you have to choose the high road. You have to choose what is right as you move forward. That responsibility extends to serving as role models for the youth of your country, sharing your experiences with them and sharing your skills and sharing your expertise to create a multiplier effect across the region. And let me be clear, Africa has undeniable challenges in terms of good governance, rule of law, citizen empowerment. One of the speakers on the first day said, all we hear about is the bad news of Africa. We need to do more to hear about the good news. And certainly, you are about that good news. But we cannot ignore the bad news because you live it every single day. When the Yali Fellows were here in 2014, we were all engrossed about the impact of Ebola in West Africa. In 2015, it was the crisis in Burundi that was so slowly burning. Today, South Sudan is very much on our minds as those brave and strong people in this country continue to suffer from the threat of renewed fighting. I know we have 15 South Sudanese fellows in this room right now. And I want to tell them, I want to tell you, that the, the United States is dedicated to working with the international community to find a peaceful solution and a way forward for the people of South Sudan. So I ask all of you, I ask all of you to stay connected with our brothers and sisters from South Sudan. Pray for their courage and their strength to face the challenges that confront them and their families over the next few years. But let's face it, while we remain involved, ultimately the leadership and the people of South Sudan will determine its fate. And that is true across the continent of Africa. Your families and friends and fellow citizens deserve stability, and they deserve the opportunity to live their lives in dignity, free from fear and turmoil. You, the 2016 Mandela Washington Fellows, were selected because of your talent. You were selected because of your potential, and you were selected because of your commitment to public service, because you are blessed with special gifts. Please don't ignore that. So because of those special gifts, you have special responsibilities. And in my view, that responsibility is to build a better future for your countries and for Africa. I know no country is perfect, including my own. You've been here during an incredible time in the US. You've witnessed polarizing times in the United States this summer. I'm referring to the issue of the well-publicized and tragic police killings of African-American men and the tragic killings of dedicated police officers. Americans have different views on these tragedies, different perceptions and assumptions that align with race. I experienced this personally myself. I have a son, of course he's black. Uh, I have a nephew who is a police officer. Both are young black men who I worry about every single day. But I can tell you this because I think it's important for you to understand that all people continue to struggle. To build a more perfect union, we have to continue to work together. And that more perfect union, we're all working in the United States to build. And I think it was important for you to see that we were not, we're not a perfect society. But we work constantly to pursue perfection. We work constantly to address issues. And we have confidence in the future of our own country. <laughs> Martin Luther King once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And sometimes it seems like it's not bending quickly enough. I know you feel that way. Sometimes I feel that way. But let me be clear, it is bending. And through YALI, through this fellowship, I hope we can continue to understand each other's struggle and make sure that we all have better futures together. I'm totally confident 
that we will achieve this in the United States and on the continent of Africa because of young people like yourselves, both in the US and in Africa. Today, I also want to note that in this midst of celebration, there is a pale of mourning in this room, mourning of a loss, and I would like to take a moment to reflect on the life of John Paul Usman, a fellow from Nigeria, whom we lost in the tragic accident this summer. And I want to offer our condolences to John Paul's family, to his friends, and to you, the Yali family. John Paul's promise and leadership brought him here with you this summer. And it is our sincere hope that those of you who met John Paul and those of you who heard of him will carry forward his aspirations of peace and gender equality as you return to your communities. And although John Paul is no longer with us today, we know he will live forever as a Mandela Washington Fellow. <laughs> Finally, as you think about your futures, I want to offer you four pieces of advice to add to what I know as your already full notebooks. So number one, and you've heard this one before, stay connected. Stay connected with each other and serve as each other's mentors, your sounding boards, and more importantly, as each other's support. Senator Kuhn said that to you on Monday. He encouraged all of you to stay connected when he spoke. Yali erases borders. We have 49 countries here today, and I see no borders between you. With, with modern technology, such as WhatsApp, the 2015 Yali Fellows taught me WhatsApp when I was visiting South Africa. Uh, you can share ideas, you can seek advice, you can commiserate with each other, and also you can mentor each other, you can inspire each other, you can provide inspiration uh, to each other. You are each other's brain trust. So let me repeat, stay in touch offer advice, and help each other to succeed. Number two, stay in touch with us. Stay in touch with your universities uh, that you attended, their amazing staff, their professors who guided you through the program, and we hope uh, that your relationship with us is just beginning. I encourage you to participate in embassy programs when you return home, maintain contact through the Yali Network and regional leadership centers, and take advantage of all of the professional development opportunities that you have. This is, I think, the lasting value for you of Yali. Number three, work on closing the gap. So I always write down notes when I talk to people if something resonates with me. And I recently met a young woman uh, who serves on the high court of Uganda, and she spoke about the need to close the gap between men and women. And we've talked a little bit about that. But this applies to all sectors of society. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is way too big. The gap between the educated and those who are not educated is way too big. The gap between those who have the advantages of Yali and those who don't is way too big. So I ask you to close the gap. We need youth leaders like yourselves to close all of these gaps. In many cases, it's as simple as extending a helping hand to one person, one person who needs a helping hand. And that hand might actually be the hand that will make a difference to that person's future. And you may not even know when you've done it, but just know that you have to do it to make a difference in this world. And lastly, and most importantly, I want to urge all of you to dream big. <laughs> Liberia, Liberia's uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, where I served as ambassador, my good friend once said at a Harvard University graduation speech, and I quote her, almost in every speech on this, because I think it is such an important message. She said, the size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity
to achieve them. If your dreams do not scare you, they're not big enough. <laughs> you all have incredible potential. Do not limit yourselves. And remember that you're already leaders. YALI didn't create you as leaders, we found you as leaders. The goal of YALI is to give you the tools to be even better, greater leaders than you might have been otherwise. So let me tell you, dream big. So let me conclude. Every single one of you in this room, you're going to change lives. You're going to change the trajectory of Africa and the world. And I'm confident of that. I'm as confident of that as I am standing here with you today. I know that I'm going to see one of you, two of you, 10 of you, hundreds of you again someday in a great place making a difference. And I just want to, again, uh, congratulate all of you for what you've achieved thus far. And I want to congratulate you in advance for what you will achieve in the future. I, I look forward to uh, meeting all of you when I'm traveling around Africa. I always ask to see the Yali Fellows. I actually have every single one of your email addresses. You may not have mine, but I have yours. <laughs> uh, and you will hear from me as I get ready to go to a particular country. I might just pick one Yali fellow uh, from the cohort from your country and say, I'm coming. Can you organize to make sure that we have an opportunity to see each other? <laughs> and the reason I do that is because you inspire me. I know dealing with all of the crises that we have to deal with, the difficulties of everyday life, dealing with war and peace on the continent of Africa, it would be hard for me to keep going if I did not have the inspiration that you provide to me and my colleagues every single day. So let me in. Go forth and do great things. Thank you.